just waiting for Gail to join. Um, I just wanted to um, basically let you know if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A part, or you can also pop them into the chat part uh, if you want everyone else to see the questions that you have as well. Um, and in the meantime, I just thought I'll quickly introduce myself while we're waiting for Gail to join us and tell you a little bit more about who I am and why I'm here. Um, so first of all, welcome to our first webinar series um, on healthy journeys. We're super excited to be kicking off um, today with, with these series and uh, I can't wait for what's more to come. The idea is to really interview a number of different people um, around healthy habits. Oh, hi, Gail. There she is joining us. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Indre. I'm not going to bore you with my last name. It's very complicated to pronounce. Welcome, Gail. Uh, and I'm hi, actually um, a wealth coach and a wealth expert um, partnering with Meaningful Paths, and I'm all about your financial health. Um, and wealth health. But today we are joined by Gail, who is an absolutely incredible um, person, and I cannot wait for us to have this chat. So just a brief introduction, and I'll let Gail go into her story anyway. But Gail Mara is an accomplished Harley Street clinical hypnotherapist. She's a writer, she's also a speaker, and she's an author of the best-selling book called Health, Wealth, and Hypnosis, The Way to a Beautiful Life. Gail is also a member of the British Society of Clinical Hypnosis and the Complementary and Natural Healthcare Council. She's a warm and personable therapist practicing a highly effective solution-focused approach to therapy. Gail works with clients all around the world from all different backgrounds and of all ages and her main goal is to really help them overcome a variety of physical emotional and psychological issues and unleash their full potential and live their best lives so welcome gail <laughs> thank you what a wonderful introduction thank you so much well it's all you you know what Anna I am so excited I've been reading a lot about your story and I think it's incredibly inspirational the transformation that you've gone through and what you're doing for other people so I think with that I'm just going to open up and ask you to share a little bit more about your story and how you got into um, hypnotherapy to start with and what led you to where you are today? Wow. How much time have we got? We have about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. So my personal journey into where I am today, gosh, if I can go back to many years ago when I was a young mum, I was in a really stressful uh, job, a really stressful career in the city, in banking and finance. Um, I found myself really searching for something or some things that I could uh, use to help myself get through and to be less focused on the job and the money and more focused on my children and our lives. But of course, I'm going back to the 1980s and that they were Margaret Thatcher's years. So she was gung ho and, you know, girl power. and We can do this on our own. And, you know, sisters are doing it for themselves and all of that. <laughs> so a lot of pressure, um, probably no more pressure than people are under today for sure. But then it, it was, a, it was um, a challenging time. Uh, I decided to take a bit of a sabbatical and uh, retrained, if you like, retrained in stress management. But again, it was corporate. So I was working with people from my industry, from banking and finance, and uh, uh, but in a different mode now. So in as much as trying to help them deal and uh, overcome stress, anxiety, addictions, all kinds wow. of things like that. 
Um, and I've always kind of been really spiritual, but then again, I have a really kind of science analytical brain and the two didn't always match up. So it, it, I, I was always at odds and, and I read every book I could about spirituality and mindfulness. It wasn't necessarily called mindfulness then. And, and I was just trying to, to, to get my life right. And eventually, um, I, I, and I was a heavy smoker. Wow. Because that was the fashion. I, I, I forced myself yeah. to smoke uh, when I was a teenager. So anyway, I knew that I wanted to give up smoking and someone had recommended I go to see a hypnotherapist. So I'm going back 20 years now. I fast forwarded for, uh, from 30 years, so back 20 years. And um, I went to see a couple of hypnotherapists and to be fair, as soon as I left, I lit up a cigarette. Mm. So I thought, oh, well, you know, that's, that's not for me and I'm too analytical and people can't hypnotize me and I'm too in control and all I wanna do is smoke and, and that's that. But I was an embarrassed smoker. Um, I'd never smoke in the house. I'd never smoke in the car. Oh. I didn't like to, I'd never smoke in the street. Oh my goodness, if my mother ever saw me, I'd have been terrified. So I never never smoked around my children. I, I hung out the window or the, the, the garden door. So it was, it, was, it was awful really, but the time came when I was ready. I wasn't sure that I was ready. I kind of relate that to the, the caterpillar chrysalis butterfly effect. So somewhere down the road, the caterpillar knows that it's time to go inside and change. Yeah. yeah. And that's what the caterpillar does instinctively. It goes inside and changes and, and emerges as a wonderful butterfly. Whilst I didn't emerge a, a wonderful butterfly, I, I went to see a girlfriend of mine who'd recently qualified as a clinical hypnotherapist. And so I thought, okay, I kind of like the sound of that. I like the sound of the clinical part. Maybe it's more science-based than, you know, I didn't want uh, crystals and, and candles burning, although I love that. <laughs> it wasn't going to work for me at that time. Um, I went to see her. She, so she, and we'd gone for lunch. I'd gone to see her at a clinic and we'd gone for lunch. And back then you could smoke in restaurants. You could smoke everywhere in public. <laughs> So I'd, I'd, I'd gone along and I said, right, I've booked a table, off we go. And she said, hang on, I've got a new uh, script that I've put together for uh, smoking cessation. Can I try it out on you? And I said, well, you know, if we've got time, I've got to, you know, pick up the kids and all this <laughs> kind of thing. So I obliged. I thought that I was doing her a favour. Yeah, that's ego getting in the way. And uh, we finished and we went to lunch and we had a lovely lunch and a catch up. And I came home by train, picked my kids up, uh, went home to dinner, did the homework with them, sat down in the evening after they'd gone to bed. And I thought, have I smoked? Oh my goodness, wow. I hadn't smoked. So I was a little cross. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little cross for, for a few days. Oh, I didn't say you could do that, but that was that. And so for wow. someone like me to have responded like that, I thought, wow. Now, I already knew about uh, the, um, the power of the subconscious mind. I already knew about that because I've been using that all my life to get from nowhere to somewhere. You know, my, my beginnings, like many other people, were, uh, were not the best. But there was something in me that drove me forward, and now I know it's my inner guidance. Anyway, um, I then studied, I went back again and, and studied psychology. And I love psychology. I'm a forever student of psychology. And, um, and then I went to study clinical hypnotherapy. Wow. And, and here I am today. And uh, I have, I work in so many different areas, so many different fields. Like you say, I've written a book about it. Um, I'm writing at the moment a book for young adults and, and teenagers, ways in which they can uh, navigate the world around them because it's difficult for 
for kids these days. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm older than you, uh, but Just when we were kids, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have uh, the same, I'm going to call it molly coddling for want of a better word, because I can't think of a better word right now, but anyone else my age, you'll know that, you know, we, we went out uh, after school or we went out at weekends and we came home when we were hungry and, yeah. and all was well. But today the kids are under so much pressure, social media, uh, exams. When I was at school, university was not a given. It wasn't, you went out to work and you, and you went out to work and you brought rent home for your parents. It was very different, not for everyone. You know, lots of people went to university, but it wasn't mainstream as it is now. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I I um, arrived at my dream location, which was Harley Street, which has always been in the back of my mind. I wonder mm. if in another life I was I was I was somehow working out of Harley Street. But there I am. I absolutely love what I do. It's a joy. It's not work to me. It's a joy to go into the clinic. Um, and I just love it. I love the feedback. I love helping people. And every time I help someone, it helps me too. Anyway, you're going to wish you hadn't asked me to start talking now. Oh, of course. This is very interesting. <laughs> and, you know, I want to pick on something that you said. And I think a lot of us are, as you were as well, aware of the power that our subconscious has. And there's a lot about mindfulness and mindset overall and and part of what I do as well you know I teach about wealth mindset and money mindset but I think quite often we sort of keep the two things apart in terms of mindset and subconscious versus hypnotherapy because I don't know it, the half is the perception that there is that hypnotherapy is just you know this thing where somebody dangles a watch in front of your eyes you go to sleep and you know you wake up and you quack like a chicken and <laughs> other funny stuff um however yes. it's actually a, a lot deeper than that and a lot more different and and I wonder maybe you can talk a little bit about you know what really is hypnotherapy how how does that work what happens what's the difference between the you know the guy on the stage versus what you do and the clinical hypnotherapy and then how the two relate Okay, right. Well, I have my own personal opinion about stage hypnosis, and I think it's great. I've been to shows in the past. Um, but hypnosis, hypnotherapy or clinical hypnotherapy is hypnosis with a therapeutic endpoint. So it's not entertainment. The people um, mainly who are part of the entertainment on stage will be willing participants, and maybe it's their opportunity, their chance to behave outrageously and not accept responsibility. Maybe it's people that really have kept a lot of themselves in inside and, and it's a moment to express themselves. And there are people who are very uh, prone to hypnosis. But in the main, hypnotherapy is, is to induce a state of hypnosis with a therapeutic endpoint. So uh, hypnosis, you and I, everyone is in hypnosis many times throughout every day. So it's a natural state. It's completely organic. So when you're daydreaming, you're in hypnosis. When you're reading a good book and you're engrossed in that book, when you have focused your attention on something and nothing in the peripheral matters you're, that you're aware of, you're in hypnosis. When you're doing something you love, you're in hypnosis. So hypnosis is a brain wave. So we have five brain waves and theta or theta, depending on where you come from, is the brain wave of daydreaming. It's a brain wave of hypnosis. And that's the brain wave frequency where your subconscious mind is more susceptible to positive suggestion. You're not asleep in hypnosis. In fact, you are in a state of, of heightened alertness, heightened awareness. So when your eyes are closed, you don't have to close your eyes, by the way, in hypnosis, you, can, you don't have to do that. But when your eyes are closed generally, it gives a signal to the subconscious mind that you're resting, not necessarily sleeping. So then you can start using your other senses and they'll become more aware. 
And then you can kind of turn the volume down on the busy conscious thoughts. What am I here? Why am I here? What's going to happen? What's for dinner? What did I turn the kettle off? All these busy, busy things. Uh, what's she going to do to me? And um, Did I make that hair appointment? Your busy conscious mind gets in the way all the time. But when you're relaxed, as in meditation, mm -hmm. then your thoughts can become more linear and your subconscious mind can then be more receptive. Have I explained that pretty well? Yeah, this is actually very interesting because I tried hypnotherapy. I used to have an incredible fear of heights you know, one of those really irrational fears where you just freak out and start crying and, you know, in, in, you're kind of in panic mode. And yeah. um, and I have a friend who kind of dabbles in, in hypnotherapy. And, you know, when I went to see her, I was very skeptical about it, as I think most of us are quite often. And I was really, what I was expecting was this sort of, complete unawareness so I thought she's gonna really put me to sleep where then she's gonna snap her fingers I'm gonna wake up and I'm not gonna have any idea of what has happened and I you know I'm not gonna remember any of it but it's interesting what you say because it really was just sort of relaxing and, and letting your mind free up and getting rid of that those thoughts that surround us but at no point was I, you know, asleep and unaware of what I'm doing. Yeah. So when it when the session was over, my thinking was like, well, clearly it didn't work on me. Clearly, you know, I'm not someone who can be hypnotized. Exactly. Yeah. But then the next time I was um, in the in, in the mountains up high, I suddenly felt like, oh, I'm actually okay with it, and I don't. That's know. right. Scared. So that was very, very surprising because my yeah. expectation was so different. Yeah. In, in with, as with anything, if you want to change, improve, tweak anything, if you have to be a willing participant to be to have to respond to hypnotherapy, no one can make anyone do, think, say, feel uh, anything that, that that's against their moral values or against a better judgment. That's just not possible because we have something called free will. We have control and our subconscious mind, which is 95% of everything we're all about, its job is to keep us safe and well and alive. So it's not gonna let us do crazy things. We have to be a willing participant. Um, if somebody comes to me, uh, I have clients who come along and just say, oh, um, my wife thought I ought to come or my mother thought I ought to come or someone else thought I ought to come. Well, I can't really help because I can't make them do something they're not ready for in the same way as I had to be ready to stop smoking. Yeah. People have to be ready and willing to change and then to trust that they can make those changes. And I always say to people who are skeptical, uh, whether it, because I say, is it mind control? And I say, I've raised five children. I've got, yeah, we've got four grandchildren and an adopted cockapoo called Teddy who thinks he's still a pup. If I had the power of mind control, <laughs> I, I'd, be, I'd be summing it in a yacht in San Bay somewhere by now. So that's not how it works, but it works. It's scientifically proven. There's no uh, doubt about how hypnosis works. And now hypnosis is coming into the mainstream more and more. I work um, and I give regular talks with the oncology department. So I, I hold talks and we, we uh, do group hypnotherapy sessions to, to promote healing, to promote calm prior to surgery, prior to test results. I work with uh, people who have dental phobias, who can have dental work done without anesthetic. There recently, in I think it was um, 2017 or 18, they did the first awake craniopathy. Crani craniopathy? Wow. Cr not craniopathy, craniotomy. Uh, like I actually worked personally with a client, and we worked together to to get to get them through that. So hypnosis has been around for a hundred years, and mm. and or more than that. To go back to your swinging pocket watches and purple capes, I only get those out for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, special request. My special request. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you know, it's very interesting how you say that hypnotherapy can work, you know, with people who have any physical issues and, and pain and all of that. And um, is I, I suppose nothing is off limits when it comes to hypnotherapy, as long as you're willing. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I work not just with with pain, it works really well with pain management, but also for depression, for anxiety, for stress, because I teach my clients how to reduce their stress levels, their anxiety levels. I can teach them with breathing exercises. In fact, I've done a breathing exercise for Meaningful Pars, which uh, which uh, has a physical and chemical response in the body. So it triggers the uh, vagus nerve and the central nervous system. And you can dissipate the excess adrenaline and start to release some lovely endorphins just with your breath. Once you know the power of your subconscious mind, there's, there's no, yeah, there's no limits. I wanted to quickly touch on your fear of heights. Yeah. Because we're actually only born, we're, we're born with two fears innately. One is the fear of being dropped, which can move on to fear of heights. Uh, the other is a fear of loud noises. They're the only two fears that we're born with. Um, every other fear is learnt behaviour. And you mentioned it being irrational. Well, phobias are irrational fears. Yeah. But it doesn't mean they're not, they don't spark off that, the adrenaline and cortisol, the, the fight and flight. Yeah. You see, today, I think more than previous decades, a lot of us are in fight and flight mode as a default. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it should be. Uh, fight and flight is actually fight, freeze and flight. But we should only be in that mode when we're in clear and present danger, if we're, there's a threat or if we're competing, if you're in competition, if you're going to give a presentation, if you're going to go out on stage. I work a lot with actors and actresses and musicians who have stage fright. So you need a little bit of adrenaline to give you that extra oomph. But primarily, you need to be able to flip back into what we call rest and digest, that lovely endorphin state, um, which is really easily done. So we get stuck in fight and flight, and then your subconscious mind isn't judging where, how you feel mm. uh, as good or bad for you. It's not judging it to be positive or negative either. It likes repetition, and what you practice at most becomes automatic. So if you practice something and it's really beneficial and you get good at it, you don't have to think about the steps you take to do it. You just do it, autopilot. But the same goes for if you get used to feeling stressed, if you're used to high levels of adrenaline and cortisol, if you're, if you're used to that, your subconscious mind's gonna produce that. It's like, okay, well that's, this is our default. Um, so I teach people uh, how to kind of reprogram themselves, go back to the true default, and our true default is rest and digest most of the time, and fight and flight when we need it. Yeah, I think the modern life has kind of led us to this sort of where where that there's this expectation to constantly be in this growth mode, to constantly be achieving, to constantly be doing, to constantly. Be, yeah. you know busy it, it, it's almost if you suddenly sit down and take five minutes you feel guilty for that as if you're wasting yeah. time as if you're not doing something and I think especially on the on the business and entrepreneurship side there's been a lot of this sort of you must hustle you must hustle if you want to succeed it has to be you know 100% of the time it's almost that people tend to take pride in the fact that they're overwork that you know they're not sleeping they're they're not sort of enjoying their everyday life because they're building yeah. and building and I think it can be very dangerous because when you burn out you know that's bad for you that's bad for everything you're not going to build a successful business on burnout you're not going to be there for your family etc and so I wanted to ask you is there something that you know all of us could do and incorporate in our daily life to help us manage that. It's, you know, fair enough. We can 
all book an appointment with you and come see you. <laughs> but is there some steps that each one of us could take on a daily basis to kind of help us reduce that sort of running towards something and that stress and anxiety that we live in? Yeah, there's lots of things we can do, but again, practice makes perfect, to coin a phrase. I, I opened my mouth and my mother came out, practice makes perfect. But you, to, to have mindfulness practice, med meditation practice, breath work practice, taking time. Ah, oh, now here's something, me time. People call it me time. Mm. So people say to me, oh, I have plenty of me time. I, I had a massage, I went swimming, I went to the gym, I ran 5K, I had my nails. Well, it, all the, I went to the hairdressers or I played a game of tennis. But that's you doing something. Yeah. That's not you doing nothing. And yeah, I read a book, I watched a movie, but yeah, you're doing something. You're not doing nothing. And it, the, the, one of the things I practice every day is just... 15 minutes, maybe sometimes 10, 10 to 15 minutes of real me time where I'll just sit quietly. I meditate, but it doesn't have to be meditation. People think meditation is difficult because they say, oh, I can't stop thinking. Well, no, don't do that. Don't stop thinking. Because if you're, if you're going to be thinking, if you're going to stop thinking, you're either in delta, fast asleep or unconscious. So, and even then the brain's still functioning, but uh, there's a, a wonderful, and I can't pronounce his name, and I won't even bother, uh, but he's um, a Taoist monk, and he said words to this effect. When you're thinking of meditation or me time or slowing your conscious thinking down, he said, allow your thoughts to come in the front door and leave by the back door. Don't offer them tea. Mm. And I really like that. So you're not going to stop your thoughts from coming because that's your conscious mind. You want that to keep functioning, but you don't have to pay attention to it. So you can just for a moment, even five minutes, just let your thoughts go, come and go. Don't fight them because the more energy you put into them, the way your, your, folk, where your attention goes, energy flows. So the more focus you put into your thoughts, the more they're going to come along. It's, for instance, if you were to think about, and I do this quite a lot, if you were to think now, and everyone is listening, about um, a lemon, okay, we've all had lemons or, I guess, lemons, limes, something really acidic. Mm -hmm. If you really think about that process, if you were to even close your eyes and imagine cutting a lemon in half, mm -hmm. maybe squeezing the lemon into your mouth and letting that acidic juice flow down your cheeks and in your, around your tongue and down your throat, and it's all over your hands. It smells amazing, but it tastes really sour. Yeah. And you salivate. Yeah. Yeah, you salivate. Absolutely. So your subconscious mind, perfect example of how it's not judging something as real or unreal. That's another thing it does. It doesn't distinguish between a real event or an imagined one. So you can imagine... Uh, Einstein said, didn't he? Knowledge is power, but imagination can take you everywhere, anywhere. Sorry, Einstein, I'm not great with, with verbatim. Um, so me time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, work at finding some time in your working day, in your life every day to just sit and do nothing. Sit with your thoughts. Mindfulness is another easy practice. So you can go through the body in mindfulness. You can uh, just focus on what you can see around you. Then you can focus on what you can hear around you, what you can smell, what you can sense, and use your senses one at a time. That brings you to the present moment. You know, we live so much in the past and also worrying about the future that we miss the middle bit. And the middle bit's all we've got. <laughs> the middle bit's... Yeah, that's the middle bit, is it? Um, and of course, breath work, uh, breathing deeply. And we won't go into that this evening, but breathing manually, I call it, taking the controls of your breath, you can do, you can go from stress to calm in 60 seconds. Yeah. Okay, so you're breathing in through your nose, 
breathing into your abdomen and you're breathing out through your mouth in a controlled way. Five cycles of that in, in the space of one minute, you've triggered your vagus nerve and you start releasing endorphins. So there you go. There, there's a few tips there that, that everyone can find 60 Absolutely. seconds, even if they can't find five, 10, 15 minutes. Everyone can find 60 seconds. And I teach that to from, from children right through to uh, adults. And it's a wonderful practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I agree. I think we all can find those, you know, 10 to 15 minutes in our day to, to really, you know, spend the time, the, the real me time, because I think that yeah. not just us, but everyone who surrounds us uh, as well, because we just become a bit calmer and nicer to be around. <laughs> well, exactly right, because we all, I mean, that's physics, it's even quantum physics, isn't it? Because our energy, what we give off, expands. <laughs> so if we're tense, then the energy around us is tense, and Nanda has had to turn the people around us are tense, and that energy just swells around and, and everyone gets uptight, but equally, and you know, my kids will say that that I can be quite annoying like that because I'm pretty zen a lot of the time. Mm. But I've trained myself to be that way. But what I find is if when our grandchildren come along, I've got on my TV, I usually put some binaural beats and just some quiet music, uh, uh, classical music even. And they used to complain, but now they don't. And everyone's just calm and chilled out. And then they leave, they leave the room I'm in and run amok. But you know, it's the yeah. energy, it's important, the energy we exchange. You know, when you walk into a room and you can sense yeah. the vibe, what's that? That's absolutely. the energy. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And, you, you know, know I, you had can, a, I have a two-year-old uh, at home and it's just, I, you know, it's so incredible to see if I'm stressed out, if I'm a little bit tense, I can see that he becomes stressed out and tense straight away. It's all absolutely. You know, I'm noticing that how I respond to his behavior and his reactions and the energy that I give off, that's what he absorbs. And it either, you know, increases his anger and his upset or puts yes. him in a calm position. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. absolutely. And for the first seven years of a child's life, they're in the programming years. So he is it your son, did you say? Yeah. He's he's watching your every move, your every response, your every word, and he's mirroring you because you're the chief programmer. <laughs> so <laughs> you you know, you're yeah, teachers and, and family and, and friends and what have you also, but you're the main programmer. Um so yeah, he's watching. So we're gonna quickly flip back to uh, phobias. Very often phobias are learnt behavior because out of someone that's seen a reaction so if mum has seen a spider and flipped out then the programming to a child is spider equals fear equals flipping out so that'll be the response so the brain is is just a wonderful computer so you can program it and you can reprogram it in neuroscience now knows that we create new neural pathways new brain cells all the time, they used to think we went, got to a, an age and it stopped. We, our brains detoxify at night. They, oh. uh, things that they, they didn't know before, they know now. So it's so important to, okay, we can't all be Zen all the time. That's not real life. And I wasn't like this when I was bringing my kids up because yeah. it was a bit of a madhouse at times. But I've learned to, uh, to be that way. I've learned to be mindful of my energy and other people. So if I'm in a, in a space where other people's energy is really negative or, or aggressive, um, I'll remove myself because I know that I can absorb it because it's an exchange of energy. So that's another thing, there's another good tip. I mean, we can't move out of our homes all the time. I mean, the family's stressed, but you can remove yourself from a situation. You can remove yourself to another room or, or get yourself in a good book, or um, I don't know, just take yourself away, watch Harry Potter or something wonderful like that, just to take yourself out yeah. of that zone for a while. And so, you know, the, given that you are in this sort of um, kind of conscious understanding of the subconscious and the mindset, 
what what are your views on you know affirmations and visualizations and all of that because i i feel it a little bit that it's been so simplified lately it's just became a trend where you know people yeah. just sort of teach you oh all you need to do is visualize and and do affirmations and and everything is going to work out and you're going to get your dream life and your dream everything but um i suppose it kind of goes back a little bit to that you you need to want the change as well just because you wake up in the morning and say certain affirmations is that really yeah. going to work well far be it for me to to uh find the face of other people's beliefs and and indeed their workings but for me affirmations are empty without the emotion that goes along with it so if you don't feel it your subconscious mind isn't interested in it so you could wake up in the morning and say um i'm 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 king of the world or mm. i'm going to uh, i'm going to go out and buy that maserati today or or you know i i'm going to find the love of my life when i walk out the door today and you can say things like that constantly but if you don't believe it if you don't feel it then they're just you may as well be just you know rhubarb and custard it doesn't it has yeah. no depth you see our subconscious mind deals in images that's what visualization works for sure visualization is it, i i could actually if you if you if somebody pushed me to put the hypnotic uh, process in a nutshell i'd probably say create a visualization uh because the subconscious mind deals with pictures so if i said to you think of a pink elephant you think of a pink elephant you don't yeah. even if you were to think of the words pink elephant you're fit, you're imagining the words pink elephant if i was to say was 2 plus 2 you'd answer me but you'd see yeah the digits so your subconscious mind sees things but it also has to see to, to feel things so if i said there's a pink elephant at the door you wouldn't be fearful because you know that's not the case but if you believed in pink elephants and you believe there could be one at your door and it and you were visualizing it your body will go through all the motions of that it wouldn't turn up of course because it's because it's not such a thing but trying to give an example of of the of affirmations versus visualization so affirmations are great so long as you have the feelings to go with them and the mm. belief to go with them so you could have an affirmation but every what they're really famous one is every day in every way i'm getting better and better that's a as a standard affirmation yeah. if you're striving to to that end if you're making efforts and you're feeling and you're seeing the results of that then you will be getting better and better every day but if you just say it because it's on a bit of flash card it's it's not going to go anywhere so affirmations are great feelings have to go with it yeah, yeah. i guess it takes work to be able to feel the things to to what you're saying yeah we all have a lot of blockages as well i mean you probably yeah. find that in your work and people Absolutely. have a lot of financial blockages yeah and they say yeah but i know i really do want to make that money i really do want that dream job but somewhere inside us yeah but do i deserve it or yeah but am i good enough and yeah but am i smart enough and i don't know if i'll ever get there and there those barriers because you feel them you believe them that's going to be a reality quantum physics says if i had put that in a nutshell and I, mm. and i don't pretend to understand quantum physics I'm reading a book at the moment actually called Quantum Physics Cannot Hurt You. <laughs> I'm not sure it. But from a quantum physics perspective if you like and someone out there who's a quantum physicist might put me right but I believe that to be anything is possible. So you can make anything happen with a reason and that becomes your reality. So to after this uh um interview here today I could go and pour a glass of wine. I could go and get a glass of water. I could put the television on. I could go to bed. I could run down the street shouting hallelujah. Whatever I decided to do, anything's a possibility. Whichever I did becomes my reality. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I kind of think that for, for me that makes sense. 
I hope that makes sense to other people. But yeah. um, maybe in my in my next life, I'll be a quantum physicist. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. And I'm kidding. I don't know about I don't know about past lives and, and future lives. Oh. I'm just throwing that out there. No, I'm open minded. Yeah. Who knows? Exactly. With that, I'm gonna just quickly see if anyone does have any questions. Now is your chance. You can either pop them in the chat box that you have just underneath, or there's a Q&A as well that you can uh, pop your questions in. So feel free to, um, to get all your answers today. This is your chance to know everything there is to know. Um, and while we're waiting on that, um, I have another question for you. I mean, I have so many questions for you because I find it so fascinating uh, what you do. And I just think that the mind is an absolute, you know, fascinating um, creation. Can hypnotherapy also help to get rid of these, you know, negative blocks and negative beliefs as we call? And, and you know, overall would be interesting to understand, is there an average that to to get rid of something this is how many sessions you need this is how long it's going to take you or is it completely dependent on the person and on the situation a uh, really really good question and i get asked it a lot as you can imagine so <laughs> clinical hypnotherapy is what we call a brief therapy so unlike psychiatry where you might be coming to see a psychiatrist for years or forever most issues can be dealt with within three to six sessions. And each session is a 50 minutes to an hour, but you can all see that I talk a lot. Sometimes I run way over, but this is the, uh, that, that's the norm. But of course, it also depends completely on the individual. There'll be people that they'll come to me for one thing, but it's like peeling layers of an onion they come and they might say this is what I want to fix or this is what I want to change but when you peel back the layers it's not at all it's something completely different um but for sure you can work on uh any issue whether it's uh physical psychological um you can work on improving everything and anything in your life um, and it doesn't take forever, but you just got to be a willing participant. You've got to be um, ready for it. So I might have a client who will come to me saying, oh, I, I can't sleep. I, I have insomnia. I just can't sleep. And sometimes all I need to do is explain to them how we sleep, the sleep process, the various brainwave frequencies we're in while we sleep. And it's okay that we kind of wake up and move around. Once they kind of get that understanding that, Maybe I don't have a problem with sleep. Maybe I'm stressed. Okay, well, let's work on the stress. You see, it's an organic process, but it doesn't go on for years. Having said that, I have wonderful clients who've been coming to see me for years, but very often it'll be for a refresher or for something very different. They might bring their children or their grandchildren. They might bring their husband or their children. It, 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 it depends. But for any one issue to answer your question there, Three to six sessions is the norm, but everyone's an individual. We all work differently. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so one you sort of answered already, but I still want to, to put it out there. So, you know, someone's saying, what confuses me about approaching work like this, although I really admire it and I'm fascinated by it, is that it seems you would approach it with a particular fear or blocker, but what if you're feeling the fear or the blocker, but you don't know it, you haven't identified it yet. Okay, so what, there's a blockage, but you're not quite sure what that blockage is, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Okay, something that's stopping someone getting to where they want to get to, and they don't understand, I'm, doing, I'm making all the moves, I'm doing everything I should, but there's got to be a blockage there somewhere. So in hypnotherapy, we'll look to unearth that. So when you can, in hypnosis, when you quite turn down the volume on your conscious thoughts, that conscious thought that's saying, well, I don't know what it is, and it could be this, it could be that, I don't know what it is. We just turn the volume down. We say, okay, let's look at what's coming up. Stuff comes up. 
oh yeah, I can remember this happened or I thought that or this was my experience or this is what someone keeps telling me. So then we'll work on that belief system and reprogram it if they want to. Mm. So we can go, I don't do what's called regression therapy personally, although I guess it comes in a little bit to what I do, but we can go back and unearth traumas, traumatic events, uh, um, negative memories, and we can even, we don't erase memories, that's impossible, um, but we can reframe how we feel about them. And I use the word feel rather than the word think, but we can reframe, we can detach emotion from negative memories or blockages or barriers and things that are stopping us from moving forward. But we unearth them. And I hope that answers the question. I've gone off on a tangent. But we, we're it's like peeling the layers of an onion and we get to the bottom in therapy of what the blockage is, what's caused, caused and what's causing the blockage. And then we work towards overcoming it. Simple as that, overcoming it. Yeah. We have another question that sort of um, continues on, on that conversation. How long on average can it take to change a bad habit or a bad pattern in the subconscious mind? Again, if you want to, if you want to stop that bad habit, it can happen in one session. So I will use, for instance, smoking cessation. If you're ready to give up, you'll give up in one session. Some people don't trust themselves and might come back for a little top up, which is great. Um, nail biting, uh, uh, lip biting, uh, hair pulling, um, trichotillomania, where they pulling hair, that kind of thing uh, can take a few more sessions. Um, but again, three to six sessions, because if, you're, if you want the change to occur, you make the change happen. I don't make changes happen. I'm a facilitator, so I facilitate the change. So if someone comes to me and they say, I'm pulling my hair, I've got evil patches, I can't stop. First thing we do is get rid of the word I can't because you're giving your, mm. your con subconscious mind a clear instruction. I can't. <laughs> it's the same as, oh, I can't remember, I can't remember that, I can't remember. Well, then subconscious mind says, well, okay, then we, we will stop looking. <laughs> yeah. We'll stop looking for the answer. So... Yeah, bad habits, um, we develop them, all of us develop them continually throughout life, but because they're a learnt behaviour or a learnt response, then we can unlearn it and yeah. learn something more beneficial every time. It's incredible. Yeah. We have one more question. This is interesting. Okay. Can regular use of breathing exercises reduce high blood pressure? Yes. Wow. There you go. Yes, <laughs> it certainly can. Because when you do, when you're doing, when you're doing breath work, particularly the the breath work that that I mentioned briefly, mm -hmm. you're triggering uh, the vagus nerve and you're uh, releasing endorphins. And in that relaxed state, in hypnosis, in meditation in relaxation, when you're sitting on a beach somewhere and all your cares are back at home, when you're really chilled out, uh, you are in that, you're in that theta brain wave and you're releasing endorphins. And so your blood pressure lowers, your heart rate slows down. Your digestive system starts to get rid of excess acidity and you, get, you can digest your food better. It has so many beneficial components to it physically. Physiological changes take place with breath work. Absolutely. What would the opposite to that, uh, talking about blood pressure there, if you were to hyperventilate, and you see a lot of us breathe up here by default. Again, that's not where our lungs aren't up there, you know, but we, <laughs> and that's going to raise the adrenaline because subconscious mind is going to think you're in trouble. Yeah. You're in trouble. You're going to run. You're going to, you, you can't get your breath. Panic adrenaline fear of uh, fight and flight so yeah. yes 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 breath work is fabulous to reduce blood pressure i'm not suggesting that if anyone's on medication they should come off medication and start breath work because the two go hand in hand and i'm not a medical doctor uh, so that the you i would always recommend medical advice if there's a blood pressure concern yeah yeah this is very interesting i guess how we 
kind of behave with our body and what we do physically can have such a huge impact on you know how we react to things and I remember I'm I'm quite into surfing and I remember when I was in Costa Rica we we had quite big waves and basically wow. the the instruction from the the guy was you know if you fall off and if you get into the tumble of the wave what you have to do which goes against your brain is you have to just relax because the yeah. more you kind of try and fight it the deeper you go down and as soon as you relax you just come back up and it it was quite interesting because I, I did get into one of those tumbles and it was incredible how the different you know physical reactions have such a different effect on your mind as well because if you relax you stop panicking and you know that everything is going to be okay and you just come yeah. up to the surface I love that I love that analogy and and I would imagine everyone who's listening visualized you on a surfboard and having a tumble in the waves because subconsciously we were with you on that brief journey so yeah I love that absolutely relaxation you know when an adult falls over we're likely to hurt ourselves yeah. I should know I'm a klutz <laughs> if there's something to trip over I'm going to trip over it no matter where it is but a child, uh, when they fall, they relax, they tumble. Yeah, we lose that ability because we go, oh, what's going on? Something really bad is going to happen. And we break bones and bruise and cut. But children relax. Okay, they, they often hurt themselves as well, but they'll relax and they'll tumble. Yeah. So relaxation is our default mode. When we come into this world, we might look stressed because we're crying because we were, but we were using... Uh, fluid in our breathing air and we need to do that to clear the lungs but we're all born in a default mode that is rest and digest that is relaxation where anything's possible and nothing's a problem and everything's yeah. wonderful and the only thing I need to do my subconscious mind innately is going to make sure that I know how to get fed and changed and, and how, how to keep warm because I cry for those things yeah. Yeah. And and then life happens and we take on all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, it's actually really interesting that you say that because exactly, you know, before giving birth, I went on to a number of different courses and read some books and about exactly how newborns just know subconsciously to look for milk. You know, if, if you're putting them on your chest, they they will just naturally crawl to where the milk comes out and will just, you know, get on it. It's like as if they're born knowing what to do. And then three days later, suddenly they're like all confused, like, oh, what do I do now? But that that <laughs> kind of that moment when they're born, it's just incredible how yeah. they're just programmed to do that. Programmed to do that. So we come in, we don't come into this world, in my opinion, as an empty vessel. I think we come into this world as a complete vessel. And then we just add to it as time goes on. Yeah, but you can take, you can pick and choose. You can really pick and choose. I mean, we can't control what goes on around us. I mean, look at the last year. God. You know, we as a planet, we've never been so controlled. Well, us in the free world anyway, we've never been so controlled. Um, and now we've had to, we can't, we've been told we can't see our loved ones, our friends, our family. We can't go to the shops we can't try on clothes we we've had all our liberties taken away um and we can't control that but we can control how we respond so we can go to the listen do you may you remember the same as everyone will that first lockdown where people were scrapping over toilet roll yeah. and i've got to tell you my husband went to the local shops and he stopped the toilet roll. get the toilet roll get the toilet roll Get the kitchen roll, get the tea. I mean, we all went, got on the back of that yeah. uh, gravy train. But my goodness, how you respond is always your choice. So you can go to work and have a, have your boss screeching down your, down, your, down your neck and giving you all the stress or your kids are stressing you out or money's the problem. But you can change how you respond to that stress. You can say, okay. I'm going to I'm going to take 5 minutes I'm going to reboot, re-energize, start again. 
Maybe I'm going to go to bed and start again in the morning. Maybe I'm going to tell my subconscious mind as I start to go to sleep at night that things are going to be clearer for me in the morning. Now, the, well, I'm, I'm talking too much. I know we're going to run out of time, but something else I want to mention is when, as we go to sleep at night, our thoughts act as a marinade. Imagine that. Yeah, wow. So um, we marinate in that stuff all night long. So it's important if you can change your mindset as you go to sleep and just be aware of your thought process. Because if you're going to bed worrying about the next day or worrying about what's just happened, you're guaranteed you're going to wake up in the morning. Oh, what was that again? Oh, yeah. Fight and flight. Yeah. So just, just to try. You can even do your breathing exercises at night just be aware of your thoughts as you drift off to sleep and know that they'll, you're going to marinate in them every night I have to say in the last months I started practicing a bit of relaxation before sleep so what I do is I switch off my phone and put it away as I enter the bedroom so I know like just sit I don't want to look at anything even if I haven't finished it's okay I'll finish whatever needs finished tomorrow I just want to switch that off and I bought myself I think it's called a Shakti mat, you know, one of those mats with the spikes in them. Um, it's just like a little, it's like a little mat that you lie down on and it has like sort of little spikes, little needles. It, it's sort of like a little massage, I guess. Okay. It wasn't I, a torture then, not a form of torture. <laughs> no, it's not. Maybe for the first three minutes, it's a little bit painful. But then it's, okay. I don't know, that I'm addicted to it because then it just sends me into this complete zen where you just I don't wow. know relax because it relaxes all your muscles with those Wonderful. little needles and it's just yeah this is how I go to to sleep every night I do that for a good 20 minutes half an hour then I put it away and I'm going to sleep with my mind clear and it's true every morning I wake up feeling great and ready for you know whatever is to come and happy and yeah it, it, it makes a huge difference I love that you'll have to send me the link I'm liking yeah. the sound of that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know about everyone else, but for me, this was one of the best talks I had in a long oh, while. Thank you. So fascinating what you do. And, and thank you so much for giving us so much of your time and sharing your knowledge and giving us all those tips. And it's just been an absolute oh. pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a joy and I, and I love to share and I hope it can help some people. and. Yeah, so wonderful. People can go onto my website and have a look a bit more about what I do and what it's all about. Um, so, yeah, it's been a joy. Yeah, and You've been a great everyone. host. Oh, thank you. And thank you, everyone who attended. And we look forward to seeing you soon in one of our next webinars. And have a wonderful evening, everyone. Take care. Bye.